Okay, this is the Cert Manager Dev biweekly biweekly meeting, and it's Wednesday, the fifth of May, twenty twenty one. Um, could just quickly go around the call and uh, give an introduction for uh, who's here. So uh, I'm Jake. I work on the Site Manager team at Jetsec. I think we've got a couple of couple of external contributors today. So if you'd like to introduce yourselves, please. <laughs> Hey, I've been here before, but my name's Akbar. I'm with AWS working on um, our external uh, plugin. Well, uh, Hi, everyone. Again, <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, wor I work for the same team as Akbar. Uh, I work for AWS ACM Private Certificate Authority. Nice to meet you all. Uh, hi, I'm Jochen Ulrich. I created the AWS PCA issue and I'm working on transferring it to the organization. Um, I'll introduce myself. Sorry, there's a little bit of lag that I'm trying to deal with with everyone. So if I accidentally talk over you, then I apologize. Um, I am now an external contributor. Um, yeah, I'm James. I uh, uh, well helped start the Cert Manager project a few years back. Um, and now work over at Apple. So yeah. Cool. Thanks. I think there, and the rest of us are all from the set manager team at Jetstack, so we're in every call. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, I guess seeing as all the uh, all the external countries here, we can move. We can start with the uh, process for accepting external issues to the set manager org and i'll hand over to ashley for this one sure um so yeah this is this is still a uh work in progress but that doesn't need to stop us from moving forward with the donation of the um pca issuer so i've linked um an issue that mile created for um creating this, this stuff and uh, having a document that we can refer to for this stuff in the future. And we have a PR in progress um, on the website for this stuff as well. Um, so what I've tried to do with this is to take what's listed as the process for core DNS and container D and other CNCF type projects that have this kind of thing in place and sort of adopt that um, and, and use that as much as possible as a, as a baseline. Um, none of this needs to be set in stone. Um, so what was actually in the document that you see in the pull request I just linked, um, that doesn't have to be the final thing. Uh, and, and if something seems too onerous or, um, or not onerous enough, I guess, then please do just say it's, it's a collaborative process with everyone. Um, one th other thing I've been keeping in mind while writing this is looking at the the code in question, the PCA issuer, and making sure that it's not going to. I'm not sort of imposing a crazy requirement that you guys would have to work really hard to, to meet or anything. I don't think that's uh, necessary. I, th I think the code as it is today is is pretty good, and and I, I I think this this is a good example of the kind of thing where this donation process would be used. Um, so yeah, I, I don't necessarily think there's any point in me going through the list of requirements now and sort of reading them out. Um, they're there. Um, and I hope they're pretty clear. Um, a lot of them are already met by the PCA issuer, such as the license. Um, I, I suspect one small piece of work that will be needed is um, maybe more tests. I think, I think that we've we'll discussed this previously and having a few more unit tests and maybe an end-to-end -end test along with the infrastructure to do that, that would that would be helpful because that can be automated, obviously. And, um, we would have that on every PR race to the repo. Another thing is the, the DCO sign-off stuff, which I'm not going to pretend to be a, 
a lawyer or a legal expert in any way, but um, maybe having a empty commit, which is something I suggested in the document, um, where you just sort of sign off. Any, anyone who's already contributed code to the project will have a commit that signs off that they're happy for the code to be donated. That just sidesteps the whole sort of copyright issue. Um, and Jochen, I think you probably have to do that. Obviously, you wrote most of the code. So um, we need something like that. Just the same as what already happens with Cert Manager Upstream and for the website, just as sort of like a, a legal flourish that we can all point at. Um, the rest, the rest, I think, speaks for itself. Uh, if you guys have any questions or anything, I'm happy to take them. Um, or obviously, you can add them to the PR or the issue as well. Um, uh, one final thing I'll say uh, is, I added a requirement that we have a point of contact from the code base um, for after after the donation happens. Um, I don't know who that would be, but. It'd be, but I think it's important that we do have someone we can talk to in case we have any questions um, after the donation is done. It's not that um, we're not like expecting the code to sort of be thrown over the fence or anything. We're not expecting you guys to disappear off the face of the planet, but sort of one person that we can contact to talk to would be good. And I also added a requirement on the cert manager side that we have a regular contributor um, who is sort of the, the sponsor or the, the shepherd for this code as we receive it as a donation. I'm happy to do that personally. Um, if anyone else wants to do that, we could have multiple people. It's all good. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to raise that if, if anyone on the side of the code being donated wanted to speak up about it. As I said, I don't expect that would be a particularly huge burden or anything. It's just someone to ask questions to if it needs to happen. Um, so yeah, I've probably talked enough. If any, if you guys have any questions, as I say, please feel free to say now. If anyone has any questions, happy to take them. Yeah, just just an update on our side. So we are actively working on adding unit tests and integration tests, and uh, and we are also looking into setting up a CI infrastructure on our side where the test will run uh, daily. Uh, inside Amazon infrastructure, and we will be posting test results somewhere on our S3 bucket. Uh, and I guess those S3 bucket can be consumed on the cert manager side if you have like some sort of dashboard that needs to consume those results. Uh, so, so we can provide those S3 bucket link when we reach there. So, so that's probably going to be most of our focus uh, for next two weeks uh, to get it up and running. Uh, on the uh, on the requirement side, so I'm looking at five zero one. Uh, so there are a few requirements which are ca called out as vital, important, and maybe. Uh, and actually, I think, like you said, most of the requirements are already met by the plugin. And, and, and of course, we are working on the test to make sure like code quality is high as the new pull requests come in. We want to make sure like nobody breaks, uh, commits a break, break in changes. Uh, you know, uh, so so that that's something on our plate as well uh, to make sure we have end-to-end -end system on our side. Uh, uh, to block pull requests wherever necessary, uh, if there are any issues. Um, so uh, on the on the license side, so I was looking at the CNCF requirements for accepting uh, uh, donated projects. Uh, so we have started working on those as well, like doing CLA updates, the boilerplate text uh, in the file to meet the the. It, I, I think it requires like Kubernetes auth authors in each file. So so we have started uh, that process as well. Uh, so we saw like a couple of pull requests are coming from a few Jetstack folks. Uh, so just want to make sure like everybody has signed the CNCF license agreement and 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 we are good to go. But but the DCO commit idea is really good. That way we can actually get like a proper sign off from everyone. Uh, so so I think that's a great idea. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. I'm not actually sure what needs to needs to be in the boilerplate header for that. Um, I do know that there's a difference um, with Cert Manager. We have copyright the Cert Manager authors uh, and not the Kubernetes authors. Obviously, Cert Manager is a CNCF uh, sandbox project. So I don't know if maybe someone else on the team can comment on what needs to be there in the in the boilerplate. James, that would we'd probably yeah. I think we'd probably either go with the Cert Manager authors or the Cert like the name of your project authors um, is my guess. Uh, it wouldn't be the Kubernetes authors, though. 
I see. So, so I think that's fine. So we can we can submit another pull request to fix that. That was something that came from Chris Enesjek, uh when Michael reached out. Uh, so those were the links that he pointed towards. Uh, uh, so, so we just copied the boiler text from from the Kubernetes link that he pointed towards for CNCF. But I think it actually makes sense if Cert Manager is keeping the same boilerplate text, uh, and this project is going to be under Cert Manager inside CNCF. Um, so, so I think that makes sense. We, we will do that update on our side. That oh, sounds good. Um, I'll it's great find to have. It. Sorry, that's the delay. <laughs> go for it. Go for it, James. I was just saying, it's great that we are like writing all this down and codifying it, and also all of the like work going on uh, with the automated testing and stuff. I think is really useful because that can also be ported over to any other issuers that we may have in future. Um, yeah. Yeah, this it's pretty clear to see how this could be used for external issuers, DNS solvers, HTTP one solvers for Acme. Uh, they, they could all be used similarly here. Um, I've just put a link in the chat of the boilerplate template that we use um, ex already in Cert Manager. Um, that would probably be appropriate to use um, in, in the donated project as well. Although I suppose I suppose there's a leap there's like an overlap when it's not copyright the cert manager authors until it's been donated so maybe this is a step we need to do after the donation actually happens because until that point the copyright is of the authors of the project so maybe adding this before the donation is premature and it's something we should be done after i don't actually know and that's sort of a point of open source licensing where it might get a bit fiddly but I'd, I'd, ultimately i think it's not going to be an issue because there's not many contributors to the project already. So it's just, we'll get it done and it'll all be fine. Yeah, I guess it, it's the legal being followed differently everywhere because Chris mentioned that it has to be done before it lands there so that like it, it has clarified all the legal concerns. Sure. Um, so I guess either way should be fine because uh, we have Johan in the room and we have like all other authors we know, like who has contributed to this one. So we should be okay either ways. Yeah. Uh, so we can decide on one or other, and we can just stick to that and and do the change once it uh, once it is transferred. That, sound, that sounds good, yeah. And and for the point of contact, uh, so uh, I'm not sure if like it needs to go in some readme file or somewhere, but I guess from Amazon's side, I can be the point of contact. And Johan, I'm not sure you want to be the second point of contact uh, post uh, transfer uh, for answering any questions. Uh, yeah. So we both can be listed. I think it should be fine. That sounds great. Thank you very much. And yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate that I'm happy to be the cert manager point of contact. Um, and anyone else who wants to get involved, obviously feel free. It doesn't have to just be me, but I'm happy to do it alone if needs be. That, that sounds great. So I guess from our side, once we wrap up all the pull request and CI system in the next couple of weeks, uh, by the time the next bi-weekly meeting, we should be at a point where we can initiate the transfer transfer from our side, and somebody from the cert manager side can accept that transfer, and and we should be good to go from there. That sounds great. Yeah, I'll um, in the meantime on our side, I'll look towards getting this uh, the PR that I've linked merged, so we have the document in, on the website itself. Um, but yeah, I, I, it doesn't seem like it's going to change a massive amount between now and two weeks time. So um, that should be good. Sounds great. And for the vulnerability response procedure, I believe on our side, we will have to update the readme file to link to the security group. And yep. uh, then probably all, like uh, the maintainers on the issue plugin side would have to be added to the security group so that we are also notified if there are any security issues um, on, on this plugin. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a good point. I, I mean, I, I don't know that you would necessarily need to be added to the cert manager sort of over, overall vulnerability um, response team. Like, I, I think you could be, and, and um, there wouldn't be a problem with that. But equally, we haven't actually defined a process by which people can join that, that Google group and get those notifications yet. At the moment, it's just kind of, a show of hands when I first made the group and the people that responded got added to it. Um, so that is definitely a thing we can look at down the road. Um, so if, I, I guess 
to, to answer your point, there's two parts to that. Um, you can be added to the group. I don't think you necessarily need to be added to the group. Um, if, 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 you, if you're interested in being added, you can be. Um, certainly, I suspect if, if a security vulnerability were to be reported in this post-donation, we'd probably CC you in um, as, as by default anyway. Um, I don't think you need to be in the group. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, it, it, just for the safety reasons, like from AWS perspective, security of our customers is number one thing for us. Sure. And, and anytime a security vulnerability is, re is reported in a project, especially where we are co-maintainers, uh, we want to be on the no list uh, so that we can like cut us a SF2 on our side and just jump right, uh, right in and fix that issue. Um, so I guess that that's the intention behind it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like just to be aware and, 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 you know, know, when to act, because it, we are 24 by seven on call for especially for security issues. Even if something comes in during the nighttime for our business hours, we will be jumping on into it. Uh, so, so, so that's the intent behind it. If we have an email, uh, we can create like a pager alert, alert on our side that if some email come on the security group, uh, we have to act on it. Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's where I was coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To totally reasonable. Um... As so we haven't defined the process by which someone would join that group yet. Um, I guess we'll need to discuss that further. Um, but yeah, I, I maybe kick that can down the road for the next meeting. Um, or we can discuss it here. I, I mean, I'm, I'm easy, but yeah, it, that, that's not in place yet, but it, it certainly should be. Yep. So, so maybe we should create like a sim for that and figure out that process as well, because we want that to happen before the transfer has happened. Um, so, so that way, because with the transfer, we will be legally supporting or co-maintaining the plugin and, and we want to make sure like this vulnerability response procedure is in place and it doesn't make sense to have a separate procedure for this plugin because it's an, it's going to go underneath cert manager. So it makes sense to make use of the overall vulnerability response procedure that we have in place. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Um, yeah, I, I, I can take that as, as a thing to write up, I suspect. There doesn't need to be much ceremony about about this, like it. Um, but yeah, we'll need to discuss it. I think further, just to make sure that all points are heard. Uh, I'll start. I will I'll, right now. I'll write a comment on our Cert Manager Dev uh, Slack channel, asking if anyone has any comments on it. Just first first point of call. I suspect no one will re respond to that, um, but. Sounds I'll, great. I'll try and define a process, yeah. Great. I mean, I remember during that, there was a and CNCF um, a question about whether we'd signed the uh, contribution license agreement. I think. So JetStack has signed it. So I think we're all good from JetStack side. Um, don't don't know about don't know about James and Apple, I, but you were you were in the in the process of getting your contributions signed off for fu for future contributions. That is, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, just the context on that. What I I haven't actually seen the changes. Okay, yeah. So is is there any change? Because that's actually one thing. I don't know if this is related. Is there any change from like DCO to like the CNCF CLA or anything like that? Just I'm aware of it. No. Not as far as I'm aware. No. So we looked. Not aware either. I think we actually we did look into it in the early stages of how how do we donate set manager to the CNCF, and we don't need to change our like DCO process as far as I'm aware. Cool. Yeah. Then, yeah, that's all good from my point of view. Um, I might have some more to share uh, sometime soon from our side, but yeah, there's no nothing that needs that's uh, critical. Yeah, I was hoping that Matt Bates would join and tell us that he'd uh, find that he'd got through the benefit legal system for actually moving the set manager <laughs> repo across, but apparently we haven't done that yet either. <laughs> It's been one week away for like two months. <laughs> I think that's often the way with legal teams. <laughs> Not gonna lie. 
Okay, so any other questions about the PCA issuer or project donation? I don't have a question. I have a question, but not specific to the donation. Um, the, the default mechanism, uh, would we consider just the, um, the key and the secret uh, access to the PCA uh, as the, the default MVP, or should the SDS token be part of the first rollout of uh, supporting access to PCA? So this was just a question to Johan, I guess. So, or is that something that we want to track separately later? I'm not sure I understood what the question yeah, was. Yeah, so the PCA today, the PCA issuer works perfectly fine because you know we've already validated that it works. But it works with a, a, a key and a secret. It doesn't necessarily. I haven't tested with uh, with a single sign-on with Okta or some other identity provider which issues an STS token as well. Um, I don't know if somebody has validated that because that's pretty common. And I want to try and see you know if that's something that we need to have on day one or uh, just the key and secret is is the is what we want to plan going on on uh, uh, the initial initial rollout. It doesn't work with um, instance roles and also with the Kubernetes AWS roles. Um, how that works, I think there was something about giving pods like an AWS IAM role. Mm -hmm. So that works too. But as of right now, everything that's standard in the Go SDK from AWS works. Okay. That, that sounds good to me from my experience with AWS. Cool. Hey, okay, well, thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, so you can feel free to drop off while we talk about the rest of our issues, or you can continue to listen if you find them interesting. Up to you. <laughs> OK. So. Last Wednesday, we released the first alpha of 1.4, and this has done the job that we want alphas to do, which is surface issues with the PRs that we've merged in <laughs> in real use. So the first one is that we added support for Istio virtual services to solve HTTP 01 challenges, and this introduced a whole bunch of pod template stuff into our CRDs because they're nested within the Istio definitions for virtual services. And this meant that you can no longer queue control apply our CRDs because the last applied annotation is too big. <laughs> um, so I think Richard looked at this the most. Do you have any? Question, um, <clears throat> anything to say about what we're up to next with this? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I We have fixed the problem, uh, or Tim has fixed the problem. Tim is the um, Google of Summer of Google Summer of Code student who has who did the original work and the fix he has, which we've merged um, some temporarily removes the pod template feature for the Istio virtual service uh, solver. Um, hence, bringing back down to a reasonable size the uh, CRDs. Um, the long-term fix is, we, we think the long-term fix is to deprecate and then remove some of the old versions of the API, which get um, uh, rendered into the CRD manifests, um, but that can't be done until we've uh, until like one or two releases in the future. We need we need to have one release where we deprecate those V1 Alpha two and V1 Alpha three and V1 Beta one APIs, and then in subsequent releases we can start uh, removing those altogether. Um, I look. There was a couple of other possible workarounds. We, in terms of um, shortening the lengths of the descriptions in the CRDs, we had a discussion about that and decided. Um, 
well, Tim came up with this third third option, which um, kind of put that um, conversation on hold. Um, what else can I say? And I read this, and another option, maybe that um, in the future, uh, those um, embedded um, API type documentation. Um, Herbe, is it? I think it's Herbe. You you found a, a, an issue where they talk about instead of embedding it, that you it, it creates a link to the documentation, the Kubernetes documentation for pod template, for example, for pod spec, for example. Um, anyway, those are all options which we had, but we, Tim has um, put in place a, a temporary workaround, and and we think the best 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 solution is to remove the old. API versions. What well, a question! Um, a question for discussion is: Which of the API versions to remove first? Um, whether to remove all of those obsolete versions at once after deprecating them, or to, or whether we try to figure out, for example, whether the V1 Alpha 2 API is in much more wide is much more widely spread, much more widely used than the other two, which were shorter lived. Um, James Munley, that's a question for you, I think. If, yeah, if you... um, so, oh, sorry, that lag. I need to fix this lag. I don't know what it is, but- sorry. No, that was my fault people. because I, I, I asked the question, <laughs> then I kept on talking and I should just stop and I- no, it's right. I think it's because you paused, which gave me enough time to talk. But because I hadn't talked for a while, because of the la it takes me a few seconds extra to actually hear anything you've said. Yeah, we should do like CB network. radio, um, <laughs> like say your question over, and then 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 we know where we are. Yeah, <laughs> and at the end, say over and out. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think um, the observation you make there about V1 Alpha two being the most widely used is absolutely valid. Um, I think it is. I doubt V1 Alpha 3 or V1 Beta 1 are really referenced in many places at all. Um, I, As much as it would kind of then make sense to get rid of V1 Alpha 3 and V1 Beta 1 first, I also don't think that really makes much sense because it will be very confusing. Um, I get mm -hmm. the feeling we might be able to say we're going to like add a deprecation warning into V1.4 um, for both the Alpha and the Beta APIs with maybe a note to say that all of the alpha APIs are going away in 1.5, so both uh, two and three, um, because they are like kind of collectively one phase. And I don't think, especially given three isn't really used much, I wouldn't want us to then have to push out everything more and more releases. And then I think in like what, that would probably unblock us and mean as soon as V1.4 is released, uh, we can actually in the main, like in the main line, branch like in, in our development branch remove mm -hmm. two and three get these things merged and alphas should then be cutting fine of 1.5 so we can actually get that feature out and at least in an alpha release um as soon as we've cut 1.4 which yeah. does mean that it is a lot sooner um yeah i i love the idea i think i mentioned it around um having like the deprecation notes in the webhook i think that's absolutely great and that will really help um, and I think as much as we'd all love to just remove things as quickly as possible so we can merge things, I do think um, we need to, you know, slow it down and just make sure that we give people the deprecation warning first and then the release afterwards, remove it. Um, in terms of like how, like we, we know that we've got the like kubectl cert manager convert command already, right? So that works from v1 alpha 2 all the way up to v1. So the actual migration path for users, I think it's actually fairly okay. It's not too painful. We've got many releases that support all of these API versions. So people can do it today before upgrading um, or after, well, yeah, or once they've upgraded to 1.4 and that's just mm -hmm. fine. Um, so we'll need to make sure, and there's actually a talk um, just today at, at KubeCon uh, from Kat and uh, Ian Coldwater on like communicating deprecations and these sorts of things. And it might be worth us going through there. Um, I think we need to just make sure we make enough noise about the fact that we're doing it and also what it means for users.
because otherwise you get you know fear and panic um it might to be worth doing something similar to what Josh has done with the um, issue implementations and the approval stuff in looking up what other projects import V1 Alpha 2 and um, reaching out to them directly and saying, look, switch to V1. I don't think we need to mess around with V1 Beta 1. V1 is supported since 1.0 and we're releasing 1.4. So that is well within support boundaries. Um, and I think it's generally sensible for people to upgrade to 1.0. Yeah. regardless um, we haven't had a problematic upgrade process since well like not i think is it not 14 or not 12 or something um so there's not really you know if people if projects are still vendoring 0.11 of cert manager i think we are well beyond the time whereby we can turn around and say no look you know there, there might it might have been problematic at the time for you to upgrade it might still be but it, this is something that has to be done because that is extremely outdated software at this point. Yeah, I think really everyone's spot on with all this at the minute. Um, yeah, so we will then we'll try and do this deprecation work before we release 1.4. Um, it may not even require a, a webhook because it's. I think it was someone found it's an attribute in the CRD where you, where you deprecate the entire version yep there are fields for deprecation warnings that i think use the same warning header in http response as the webhook warnings nice and does that allow us to put a custom message there too so deprecated and there's a deprecation message there's no way for us to know how many people are currently on using what versions, I guess, right? So there's no way we can know what manifests they are submitting, but what we can see, and I think the ones who just have manifests is actually the one that worries me least because we can do like kubectl cert manager convert to convert those resources. And as well, when they submit those resources to the API server, um, they will actually see those warning messages. It's more the projects that depend on it, as in like the projects that might use like a V1 Alpha 2 lister or informer or something like that. So if we have a look at what imports, I think PKG slash API slash like cert manager slash V1 Alpha 2, we will then be able to see which projects are actually depending and utilizing those types. Um, the other thing actually I did raise, and we do need to really I think all of us sit down, upgrade our clusters and uh, test things out is the storage migration piece, making sure that we communicate to people to like how to migrate their resources. Because a lot of resources may have been submitted a year ago in V1 Alpha 2 and haven't really been touched since. And we need to just make sure that they don't have any CRDs stored um, or instances of their custom resources stored in V1 Alpha 2 format because uh, the API. Oh, actually, a conversion we, webhook. We can. So the conversion webhook will do it until we remove any trace of V1 Alpha 2 from the CRD, because then the API server won't know how to decode it. So actually, what you'd normally do is do this over an additional API um, version um, and flip the served uh, field yeah. to be served false, which would actually push us out one extra version. Because if you do that, then it gives them a chance to like v1 alpha 2 won't be accessible but the api server still will be able to decode things from etcd in v1 alpha 2 format submit them to the uh conversion webhook and then when it goes to persist them again it will actually rewrite them as v1 because that's our current storage version um yeah so i think the official process would actually look at deprecation first then changing serve to false and then removing it which is slightly more painful for us. Yeah, no, that's, that's it. That. We made a mistake when we did the version one release. We didn't follow that. I remember, I can't remember the details, but we didn't follow that process and it caused upgrade problems. Yeah, we might have done well to have, upon 1.0 release, you know, the benefit of hindsight, to actually deprecate them then and put the message in then. Mm. Um, just to let people know, because now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no message, but it has been a year, so 
hopefully, yeah, I guess people don't move unless they, unless there's noise. But the 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 alternative here, really, if we're following the guidelines to make people's lives as easy as possible, is we put a deprecation warning in for one point four. In 1.5, we flipped serb to false. And then in 1.6, we would be removing the first two alpha versions. And we can overlap these processes with the beta version as well. So in 1.4, we could deprecate beta. And we could actually flip serb to false on 1 .4, in 1.5 and then remove them all for 1.6. But it does mean that we are now talking about an extra release cycle out before we can um, except something like the Istio changes uh, in there. The alter I mean, we can obviously have the Istio things, but it does just mean the, ins the installation upgrade process changes to be a replace instead of a, um, a an apply. Well, that was um, another point I was going to make. I'm taking up too much time maybe, but another point that came out of that whole conversation was that uh, when I reviewed that PR, I noticed that the pod template field didn't really need to be duplicated under the new Istio um, virtual service um, stanza. It, it really belonged higher up. It's a, the pod template is shared between the ingress and the virtual service based solver. Um, but that would be our that would be where Urbay's deprecation webhook based deprecation mechanism might come in. Because I, I wondered whether we could deprecate the existing pod template field inside ingress and and introduce the new uh top higher level pod template field uh, i don't know whether that's whether that breaks our compatibility um rules. so i think that yeah that would become a conversion really i think the complex so and this actually then leads on to another question i'm sorry to always just pull out more and more horrible things from the box mm -hmm. whenever we come up with good ways forward um, when it comes to like external HTTP01 solving, it raises the question of whose responsibility is it to launch those pods? If, for example, um, let's say a world where Google Cloud's load balance has allowed you to kind of post it a thing to say, at this path, always serve this text, and someone implemented some external uh, Google Cloud load balancer solving mechanism, in that instance, you wouldn't want cert manager to go and create pods to solve challenges. You would want to go and mm. configure the Google Cloud load balancer to do it. And so it is if we promote that and move that up a, a level so that it's kind of universal across all solving types or solving strategies for HTTP01, um, things start getting a bit hairy. So I actually do agree with you that it kind of feels like it should be a level up. But then as soon as you introduce the idea of external solvers or solvers mm. that don't work based on launching pods it gets prickly again and if we were to ever have, have say we could even implement an entry mechanism for uh http01 solving that doesn't launch a pod on demand for each one like we've discussed before but actually launches a single pod or there is a single pod launched at uh, deployment time that deals with solving it kind of starts to break that model a little bit and, and another question which came up matt bates was almost saying he he had a he asked whether we should even revert the Istio virtual service work because um, uh, in with a view to some future um, pluggable HTTP zero one solver mechanism uh, and with a view to supporting something some other API I think it's called the gate, Gateway API Jake knows more. Um, yeah, we talked about yeah we talked about it a bit as well. But probably everything should move. Oh, sorry. Uh, my, my idea was like everything should be pluggable, and I talked a little on the issue. And James put a comment saying if we improved the webhook APIs and move and like got a bit more towards a beta API than a alpha API, we could put something there. But it wouldn't be in the set manager v1 api we'd have to go we'd have to make like a set manager experimental and think about how it works <laughs> it's a big it's a long it's a long piece of work i think go ahead james so 
Yeah, I think it's, I don't think it actually needs to be some kind of an external thing. I think what we'd be looking at is effectively a V1 Alpha 2 of the webhook API, or maybe maybe even moving away from the idea of webhooks for this altogether, and instead having like a controller-based mechanism for building HTTP01 or DNS01 solvers. I think we could do it more simply. It certainly is more work than just merging Istio support, but that is like the re we have had these requests before for both Istio and Contour and a few other things. Um, but really, like at least in the past, I've kind of like not, we, we didn't look to merge those for exactly that reason. That really, where do you draw the line? Um, yeah, as Jake says, the list will always get longer. Um, where do you draw the line? And actually maybe a focus on supporting these things uh, built externally is the better way to go. And I, I do still believe that. Um, and I think even if we were to merge Istio today, it's something I can totally see this being a sore thumb for us to deal with when it comes to things moving to be external. Um, and it's something that in a V2 API would probably look to being like, in a view to like V2 and you know having support, better support for external everything. I think it's something that we'd want to then remove. Um, so yeah. I, I do kind of think if we could focus our efforts on external, like improving the external DNSO one support, and also like, although that does exist now and people do use it, so that's probably like maybe a lower priority, but maybe building out a new mechanism that supports HTTP01 and DNSO one, and then promoting that through um, would be, you know, probably better. And I think as well, the DNSO one, one big issue I see today is actually around the fields that get encoded onto the payload uh, that's submitted to each webhook uh, they are already like pre-signed by account keys and there's a few issues there that mean things like picking up the uh, Zenolf slash lego dns providers isn't possible today you can't build a dns01 webhook for cert manager that just exposes all the lego dns providers for exactly that reason and that's also a similar reason why you couldn't just go and take the current DNS01 webhook API sort of hack around a little bit and use it for HTTP01 because there's a bit of pre-signing being done before submission. So that whole API needs a bit of a look over. And if that were to be done, we could then better support HTTP01 as well as DNS01 in a cleaner way and promote that API forward. So I hate to be so on set and I wouldn't veto anything um, because you know this is obviously everyone everyone maintains this project, but I do lean towards basically improving our external pluggability support. What about reverting the Istio virtual service work? It would be a shame for Tim, but given all of that work he's put into it, but it might be for the best. It seems like an unfortunate no brainer, doesn't it? Cheers, Jochen. Well, um, perhaps we'll discuss it further uh, it, it, it on GitHub. Yeah, we're we're not going to get through our agenda at this <laughs> at this rate. Um, I should we move on from the based area virtual service discussion? Continue on GitHub. So there is an urgent issue then in the 1.4 alpha, which is that we can no longer run our update CRD script. And this is caused because um, someone put some Helm annotations in, or Helm directives into the CRDs, which causes controller gen to choke. Yeah, I, I'm gonna put my hand up and take ownership for that mistake because I totally forgot all the horrendous helm stuff that we do to our crds and at the time of us having like switching to that i remember we did i remember now um the only reason why it works is because we were able to quote all of the like put double quotes mm -hmm. around all of the helm directives and um that yeah totally forgot that that does need reverting and then rewriting to all be quoted okay so you need to rewrite we need to revert that pr and rewrite it Quote everything is that well, it's not really quotable. I mean, it's, it's like an if else statement, 
um, that's, that's being put in there. It, unless there's some other way to embed the if else logic inside a quoted value. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I suppose the issue here is that we are trying to swap out which struct field, like which like yeah. whole struct stanza that we specify as opposed to just a single value. And I think we managed to avoid that problem before because we just didn't have many of those hmm. types of switches. Okay. But we should just revert it pretty quickly, I think, because it's blocking someone else who is kindly updating all the dependencies to give it as 1.21. Why are they doing that, by yeah. the way? Why why one twenty one? Is which which version of Kubernetes are we on now? Release. Oh, right. okay, yeah, we're on one twenty one. Sorry, I've lost track. Right, and we need to, that does need to be done <laughs> for following the normal the normal deprecation timeline of Kubernetes client right, code. Right, right. Multiple times a week, I have to Google yeah. Kubernetes release releases, <laughs> and then grep for the highest number. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. tomorrow because they build a lot of other projects on top of. Um, they run kubedb, and I think depends on cert manager. And I know tomorrow has goes through this process every three or four months to go through a ton of projects and update them. I know this because we used to race to update the dependencies on the projects that we both depended on beneath us. <laughs> is he? Is he? Is he doing that? Because he's facing the same issue we faced with importing Istio's um, generated code, which had dependencies on particular Kubernetes components. And is that an argument for us to, to bring forward the idea of publishing our API as a standalone repository? What's the reason? Uh, potentially, uh, that would, hmm. yes. Yeah, so that potentially might actually help. It would be worth chatting with Tamal about what areas of our code base uh, they actually need and if it is just APIs. If so, then yeah, I'd agree. Um, that could definitely help because they could use a, like a, well, they could just depend on 121 despite ours being 120. And as long as there is vague compatibility, which there should be, because it'd only be deep copy generator being used there. Um, I think that'd actually work. Uh, I do also sure. think that we, like, as an assignment, we need to fix it. We talked about doing the same mechanism that Kubernetes do, of having the APIs in a staging directory and then automatically publishing those to a different repo. So I'm not against having a staging thing. I kind of slightly am, though, because the whole existence of staging in Kubernetes, at least, was meant to be a stepping stone to having them actually external. The things that make that difficult is the fact that it's a change, like a quite significant change in workflow. You need to merge your API changes ahead of merging any controller changes. Um, I will also say maintaining that publishing bot is not mm. totally trivial. There's things to do with like Go mod rewriting. There's, if you want to hit subscribe on the Kubernetes publishing bot has failed with GitHub issue, that's three or four years old and gets opened and closed by a bot automatically and dumps out a load of horrendous Git hmm. errors that come up every now and then. I, like, I can't seem to unsubscribe myself from this issue, so I've just been getting it for ages. Um, it's, it might be worth trying. I'm not actually, like, maybe ours is simpler because we have fewer complex dependencies. Yeah, um, and it does mean that we do can that. then develop things hmm. in repo. Um, but it would be good as well to consider if we can build up our workflow to have like a cert manager slash API repo where we are merging changes into there and like very carefully thinking about our APIs before touching controller code. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's a ton of prior art in doing it that kind of way around. So maybe it's going to be difficult. It's a workflow issue really. So I, again, I wouldn't like to like prescribe anything one way or another because it's stuff that everyone has to deal with. Okay, I won't put like we won't put any actions just yet, but it is something to think about. I think the action on the um, home chart stuff is we are going to need to fix yeah, that. Yeah. And actually, I think the feature I've, request I've... is very much valid. 
Um, so it'd be good to come up with a way around it. On the staging side, if someone wants to start experimenting with publishing our API things, I do think that's separate um, from this issue specifically. I think it'd be interesting to see how painful is it really to have a staging uh, directory. I've, I think I've just got an aversion to it because of the number of emails I've got, but uh, it, it, theoretically it does make sense and it works and it does make for a nice workflow with committing changes all in one go. Cool. Any other, MV, anything else on the CRDs? Yeah, I think we should revert it. And we'll, I think we might have to revert both of them, which is sad. Both major 1.4 features to fix them, which is sad, but never mind. <laughs> That's what the alpha is for. Um, Okay, next, this issue keeps coming up. Um, Vault, if you're working as an intermediate correctly. And I think James put a comment saying that we actually need to parse the chain correctly rather than just assuming that the top one is the uh, C8. I guess <laughs> it's just a, does anyone volunteer to fix this for 1.4? <laughs> Yeah, I can. Uh, I could give it a stab. So, if I understand correctly, um, we need to actually find out properly, programmatically, which one is actually the CA, and rip it out. Yeah, and have this for all if issues. Exists, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not just the vault one. All issues. Oh. Yeah. And um, I guess we need to do I that think... by the um, issuer subject, I guess, and just build the tree, and. Take the top of the tree, right? Yeah, go as far up the tree as you can. And if there yeah. is no root, you if you don't end up as a root, then we just don't populate ca.crt. Even if the intermediate would. Would you not always do the toppest one? Say if you had two. No, that's and the, the, the top, the head one, that is the issue, right? Yeah. Basically, right now, the top one could end up being. Well, in the vault case, it's actually a little bit different basically vault will only actually give you a root ca if you've submitted a root ca to it and there is actually a specific like root underscore ca parameter in the returned response which we assume that if it's not set then we go and take i think the top of the ca chain um and use that which isn't always correct but it could be in some cases it could be depending on how the users configured it um which is where like we end up with this weird behavior where it works with some people because they've actually mm. technically misconfigured their vault instance. And then for the ones who have correctly configured it, I think it doesn't work. Oh no, it's the other way around, I think actually. Basically we need to be more intelligent. Mm. I'd say the, the define one point four the fix needs to be just for vault. Mm. Define correctly uh, correct configured though, right? As in well, yeah, I mean you can configure it either way. Correct here, I mean, like you can actually submit, like you could configure a Vault PKI backend saying, here's the signing certificate, which is an intermediate. Mm. Um, and here is the root CA. And you'd actually submit that root CA to a different endpoint. And mm. then in responses back from the end user, it would say root underscore CA equals that. And then we could pick that out. Mm. Um, the issue is if someone submits a root CA and an intermediate to the signing endpoint, like the endpoint that says use this for signing, but mm -hmm. will then use the intermediate for signing, but it will return that whole thing as the chain. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mm -hmm. where things start getting prickly, I think. So uh, two things. So number one, we basically, not only do we need to be more intelligent everywhere by doing this kind of building the tree, taking the head off, making sure it's a root CA. Also in the vault issuer, we probably might need to do another API call potentially to get that CA endpoint. So that API call is being done. I think yeah. that was part of the changes, if I okay. recall correct. I mean, uh, I need to dig in actually, because I am yeah. now going off the trodden path of what I do remember. But I summarized it. I think, I think I summarized it quite well in that issue. I can't remember if I missed a bit of it though. The, um, I, I think it, I think it was very clear when you summarized it in that issue, James. I think I, th I thought that was sound. It's, my my second question was going to be. Was the question was going to be? Um, do we only ever have roots in 
CA cert or I would have thought it would have been it would be correct to have intermediates in some cases in your CA cert yeah absolutely and I think that's part of the issue like right now uh, again I need to actually dig back into this area code to get the context right now we make assumptions that like around if you're at the top of that issuing CA list that it is a root and we just go and set that as ca.cert uh, what we need to do though is actually check I think that's the problem right now that we're not really checking it's just a naive mm. take the top one bang it in no, there because exactly as you say the intermediate is likely to be assigning CA mm. but my my point is that um we should never put intermediates in the CA set I think you can uh, anything that has the no. CA basic constraints could reasonably go in there so I, I guess this is a question we, oh sorry I see people talking and I haven't heard them yet I, I'm pretty sure what we said in the documentation because we did have like a this kept going around in circles for a while and I'm pretty sure we ended up concluding that ca.crt should only ever contain a root only ever and everything root, else yeah. is a chain that mm. said that said, if one of your intermediates is a signing CA, mm. um, I mean, ultimately that signing CA is signed by something else. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think there are I think there are worlds. We did cover this. Case. There are worlds if, where you'd only want the intermediate, though. I think. If yeah, if so, I'm not. If if you've got. An, inter an intermediate, by definition, is a signing CA and could be explicitly trusted by being added to a trust store on the verifying client's machine. So there are situations where someone would explicitly trust an intermediate CA, by which I mean a CA which is signed by a different key and not its own key. Mm. Um, so there, there is a world where you might want to have that there, but you end up in this crazy world where you've kind of got like a, a, a route that doesn't really matter to anyone because you trust mm -hmm. the intermediate explicitly. Yeah, I mean, if I've got, but I, you maybe do actually want to do this because you want that kind of separation. You'd have a single, you know, enterprise root CA somewhere and you have two environments containing N number of clusters and they both operate over two different intermediates. And you don't want those two to yeah. necessarily trust each other, right? You, you want that cryptographic separation. Um, it's. I think. I think in practice, having worked with like a sort of split CA thing where there was a separate intermediates for separate purposes, mm -hmm. it doesn't really work very well, and like is to be discouraged if you're going to try and set up something like that. Uh, it just adds a ton of complexity for not a great, be great, great amount of value for mm. me. Um, but but, but it, like, it's possible to construct scenarios where you would want to do it. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, yeah, that's my point. It's like, yeah, I think then there is enterprise use cases for having that kind of setup. Yeah, uh, I, I've yeah. had it where um, there was a root which issued two intermediates, one of which signed for test environments and one signed for prod environments. Mm. And it's terrible, mm. and anyone doing it should not do it, but mm. people do do it. Yeah, um, I would, yeah. I think actually you are right in saying that we might need to give people an option here. Um, I think what we, the issue for the vault case right now, I think we can probably take some action to fix the environments we've just gone and broken. Um, I do think that Josh, your point about, and actually as well, like it's to be discouraged, but I am definitely aware of cases where this is being done. Um, and I hate it but it does get done. Um, so there might be another discussion. I'm trying to think like, do we want to try and do what we can to get back to a steady state now where we unbreak the things we broke and then move forward from there rather than adding more and more and more and more changes. And especially like most importantly, delaying a fix for mm -hmm. those environments we just broke. So I have the opinion that we should go back to the steady state on the basis of trust root distribution whatever that means as a feature, which is on the roadmap, um, that seems like the kind of feature would solve this issue, uh, whatever that feature looks like, but it sounds like it should be complementary, or at least kind of, yeah, 
help with those situations. What that feature actually does or means or whatever is another discussion, but, and perhaps I'm just, you know, picking the can down the road. Yes, it is. I, th I think, yeah, that would be a really good thing to have, but yeah, the, the vault PR that James has linked there is, 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 is a bug that needs fixing. And that's sort of the first thing that to do for me. Yes, that's we should just we should fix the vault issuer and think again <laughs> for the rest of it. Yeah, that's a good summary. Yeah, I, I actually need to run now. Does anyone want to take over, or do you think we can push the rest of the items? Is anyone desperate to go through anything? <laughs> I'd rather stop now. <laughs> okay. Oh, I was just like the page to stop, please. <laughs> Just, just wanted Got to say that um, to get on now. Okay, never mind. Supported Rudy's page. Please check it out. <laughs> That's everything I wanted to say. Okay.